All right, history fans, welcome to another exciting edition of History 17B. At this point in the class, we are now examining key trends, developments in American history in the post-World War II era. We've already begun that with our lecture on the Cold War. The Cold War is the key development in American history after World War II in regards to foreign policy and America's role around the globe. But now we're going to pivot and really for the rest of the quarter examine key developments within American history after World War II domestically, events within the United States. And we will begin that here with the first of two lectures examining the issue of race and civil rights. In lectures this week, we will examine the efforts of racial minorities, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, towards a more generous America. Once again, we will wrestle with the questions that are at the heart of the argument without end. What does it mean to be free? Who is an American? What defines this nation? What we will see in these lectures this week is how racial minorities who had long been denied equality, freedom, opportunity, recognition as a full and equal member of this nation will rise up in a variety of efforts and demand change demand that they be recognized as full and equal citizens of this nation, have an opportunity at a variety of forms of freedom as free individuals in a nation that at the time during the Cold War claimed it was a beacon of freedom for all of humanity. What we'll see in these lectures is how racial minorities called America out on its lack of freedom for its own citizens and demanded a more free and just America. We will see how this question of American identity and what defines this nation is really at the heart of civil rights because civil rights was about holding America accountable for its rhetoric, its image of itself as a nation that was defined in liberty, freedom, equality, opportunity, but had failed to realize those goals and ambitions. So this is again, another moment for us to think about American history as an argument without end. And in particular, in these lectures, we will see how those central questions of freedom, citizenship, what defines this nation, were really alive and at the heart of what we understand as the modern civil rights movements of the post-World War II period. One way to begin our study of the key developments in the post-World War II civil rights movement in regards to race, racial equality, and racial citizenship, the landmark Brown v. Board of Education ruling in 1954. Earl Warren had served as governor of California in the late 40s at a time of great change in California demographically, as so many people had come to California during World War II to serve in the war effort or to participate in the wartime industry. We documented that some in our lecture on World War II on the home front, the great shift in demography in California, the racial turn that takes place in California as California became such a magnet for people around the country. Earl Warren was governor of California in the late 40s as, America was ex as California was experiencing not only a major economic boom, but also a new demography with a greater visibility and presence of racial minorities who had come to California to serve in the war effort and in the wartime economy. In 1947, there is a federal ruling, Mendez versus Westminster, that mandated the end of segregation in California public schools targeting Latinos. The Mendez family, in that Mendez versus Westminster case, was a Latino family that was forbidden from sending their children to the local public school because in California in the late 40s, racially segregated schools predominated. In California, like so much of the country, public education was segregated. Well, in 1947, that ruling ended such segregation targeting Latinos and as governor, Earl Warren took advantage of that opportunity to help pass legislation that also ended racial segregation in public schools targeting Native Americans, targeting Asian Americans. So California was one of the first states to desegregate its public schools in the post-World War II period, 
during a time in which California had become more diverse and pluralistic as a result of demographic change. Earl Warren, after serving as governor of California, would become the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And as Chief Justice, he would preside over the landmark Brown v. Board of Education ruling that would end segregation in public schools nationwide. So what began here in California and other states in 1954 in this landmark decision would now be applied to all states in the nation. Brown v. Board of Education ruled segregation in public schools unconstitutional, a violation of the 14th Amendment. And that's key here. One of the themes that I will stress in these lectures on race and civil rights is that this is really the first time since Reconstruction where the federal government is playing the necessary role it must play in the cause of civil rights. As I stressed in our very first lecture, doodaloo, 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 many weeks ago, and as I reiterate here now as we return to this theme, civil rights only goes forward in American history when the federal government forces states and individuals to do what they're not inclined to do, treat racial minorities equally under law. Civil rights, the advances that have been made in regards to civil rights in this country's history are changes that are not a function of one day every white person waking up and embracing racial equality and wanting to live side by side with racial minorities. That day, let's check our watches, our calendars, yeah, has yet to come in America. Instead, the cause of civil rights has gone forward when the federal government intervenes and forces states and individuals to do what they're not inclined to do, treat people equally under law. That was the case during Radical Reconstruction, when the Radical Republicans had this one moment in the late 1860s, early 1870s, where for a variety of factors, as we explain in that lecture, the nation was ready for such change in the name and realization of legal equality. And so you got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. You got this brief moment where former slaves can vote where former slaves are elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. But then in the 1870s, the federal government turned its back on that necessary role as the protector of vulnerable minorities, as the guarantor of equality under law as mandated under the 14th Amendment. And you had 100 years of apartheid, Jim Crow, segregation, race riots, the history that we have examined over the last few weeks. But now, in 1954, the federal government is back in that role it had failed to fulfill since Reconstruction. What the Brown decision declared was that states, school boards, individuals cannot treat citizens of this nation in an unequal way because the 14th Amendment mandates equal protection of law. So here, the lessons we learned about Reconstruction many weeks ago in our very first lecture are important because for the first time since the 1870s, the federal government in 1954 is back in this role in the Warren Court as in the vanguard of protecting civil rights for all, enforcing a 14th Amendment that had been uh, part of the Constitution since 1868 but had been neglected, ignored. I want to stress to you that the Warren Court is a return to that Reconstruction focus, and the Warren Court is really an anomaly in American history. Because for most of our history, the Supreme Court has been a very reactionary institution that has largely thwarted, ebbed efforts in the name of civil rights. We have seen that in this class. There have been many Supreme Court decisions we have examined in lecture that represent a way in which citizenship, equality, have been curtailed, foreclosed at the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court, Plessy versus Ferguson. Buck v. Bell. Fred Korematsu, the Japanese-American who challenged his incarceration under internment, had a U.S. Supreme Court decision 
that ultimately upheld the internment of American citizens. The exception to that rule that in many ways has returned now in the 21st century of the Supreme Court as a force that limits an expansion of civil rights, the Warren Court. And that begins here with the Brown decision, where once again, the federal government, through the Warren Court, through the Supreme Court, is in the cause of civil rights, greater equality, greater freedom for all Americans, by now for the first time since Reconstruction, enforcing this 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment is a key part of this history. It was born in the Reconstruction era when the federal government then had an opportunity after the Civil War and with the end of slavery to guarantee equality for all. However, the federal government turned its back on that promise for a century. Now we are back in what many describe as the second Reconstruction, the modern civil rights movement, where the federal government is back in that role. So the Warren Court in May of 1954 declared segregation based on race in public schools unconstitutional as a violation of a 14th Amendment that demands equal protection of law. It's a good example of many of the themes we're stressing here, how the federal government must play this role in civil rights and the ongoing significance of the 14th Amendment as that effort of Thaddeus Stevens and the radical Republicans in the 1860s to get this ratified has been such a force for civil rights in the 20th and now 21st century. The Brown decision declared segregation in public schools unconstitutional. And it's important to stress this because this is another way of seeing connections. What are we talking about when we talk about public schools? They're not just taxpayer funded schools. They're not just schools that you attend based on public financing. Public schools by their very nature are for the public, the people. For a century after the Civil War, even prior to the Civil War, when the very first public school systems were created in the North in the 1820s, 1830s, those public schools were racially segregated or racially exclusive for whites only. So our vision of the public through that period was for whites and whites only. What do we think of when we imagine the public? Who is an American? What do the first three words of the Constitution, we the people, mean? Well, for most of the history of public institutions, including public schools, that vision of us, the public, was limited to whites and whites only. And so you had active enforcement of segregation. The Brown decision says, no, these children are citizens of this nation too. They are members of this public and they deserve to attend the same public schools as other citizens and members of this public community. So there's so much here, History 17b, in regards to, again, the argument without end. I mentioned a moment ago that many scholars refer to the modern civil rights movements that we're examining at this point in the class as the second reconstruction. And there are many, many reasons to do that because there are links between Reconstruction in the 1860s and 1870s and the civil rights movements of this period. There's a way in which the legal infrastructure established in the Reconstruction period, the 14th and 15th Amendments become once again relevant and enforced in the second Reconstruction. Sadly, there are other parallels, assassinated presidents, whether it is Lincoln or Kennedy and many other martyrs who will die lose their lives to make America a better, more generous nation. So some scholars refer to the modern civil rights movement as the second reconstruction. And you can judge for yourself whether or not that's applicable by the end of these lectures. At the time, people who lived through the Brown decision referred to it as a second emancipation. They, at the time, made this connection that I'm stressing to you here. It isn't just me, the dorky historian, in the 21st century who's seeing this connection between the post-Civil War period and the post-World War II period 
African Americans and other civil rights activists saw this themselves, and they referred to the Brown decision as the second emancipation, putting it on par with the end of slavery and the gains made in its aftermath in the early Reconstruction period. However, this is a very limited step towards a more equal America in so many ways. First, the Brown decision only applied to public education. Now that's incredibly significant in of itself though, remember, because when we're talking about public education, we're talking about us, the people, the public. We are running right into that question of citizenship, that question of who is an American. So we don't want to discount how important this is because this is much more than school books and classrooms. This is very much about who is one of us. But despite that significance, the Brown decision only targeted public education. Private individuals, private institutions could still segregate based on race, forbid services to racial minorities. Other public institutions could still enforce Jim Crow segregation. So this is a very modest step. Furthermore, Supreme Court made its decision. Guys in robes in Washington, D.C., like Earl Warren, made this decision and announced it. But what is it going to mean in reality? Are we going to expect people who for decades are invested in racial exclusivity, a vision of America for whites only, to now say, well, uh, I guess the Supreme Court made its decision. We have no choice but to open our schools to black children, black learners? Of course not. Are we going to expect people who are deeply invested in racial hierarchy and white supremacy to shrug their shoulders and accept equality? So... As we'll talk about on the next slide, the decision is just a decision. What about enforcement? What about resistance and backlash? It's one thing for the Supreme Court under Earl Warren to now assume this role that it has consciously and deliberately neglected for a century as the guarantor and protector of civil rights for all. But it's a hell of another to actually see that manifest in reality. There is no provision in the Brown decision for how to implement this, enforce this, and there will be backlash. There will be efforts to prevent desegregation of public schools. So Supreme Court made its decision, but enforcing it would to this very day remain a very difficult and stubborn problem. As even now in the 21st century, we see public schools in a de facto way segregated based on race. But we are at a key moment with the Brown decision. That's why we begin this lecture with it. With the Brown decision, the federal government was back in this role that it had neglected, a role that it must play. The story of civil rights, the story of big government. It's a story of the federal government intervening and protecting people who are subject to inequality. The federal government is back in this role now under the Warren Court. Warren Court, again, is an anomaly. We like to focus on those, this era because you get the Brown decision. We'll talk in a moment about a Supreme Court decision that will overturn segregation in public transportation leading to the end of the Montgomery bus boycott. The Warren Court would also issue a number of rulings designed to protect citizens from police abuse, decriminalize birth control, um, play a crucial role in creating a more free and just America. But it is an anomaly because after the Warren Court, the, the, after the Warren Court, the Supreme Court makes a conservative turn and it has arguably been, been in that status ever since the 1970s. And the larger history of the Supreme Court is one of, again, ebbing or limiting greater equality and freedom. But we are at this moment where Earl Warren is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and we're going to see efforts, not just from the Supreme Court, but from the federal government in a variety of roles, in its necessary role as protector of civil rights, attempting in this period 
to create a more just, equal, and free America. So in the previous slide, I attempted to urge you to see the complexity of Brown, how in one way, it's remarkably revolutionary. It ends segregation in public schools, public schools where the whole issue of citizenship and identity is really at the heart, at the center. It returned the federal government to this role that it had neglected for a century and it set the stage for potential gains going forward from that federal government and the Warren Court in particular in the cause of civil rights. But the other way to think about Brown is how modest a step is. It only applied to public education. It couldn't be directly enforced as it was Supreme Court ruling. But despite that, despite how modest a change this is, it sparked a huge backlash. And that too is revelatory. The modest change that Brown offered, likely because it did center on these issues of who is an American, sparked an intense backlash. And now we are at another key theme to keep in mind in regards to our story here in these lectures of civil rights and race. Steps are made, advancements are made. People, as we will see, will lose their lives and shed blood to make America a more equal and generous nation. But as they do, as they make those sacrifices and those sacrifices bear fruit, retrenchment, backlash among Americans who cannot accept the idea of racial minorities as equal members of this nation. So as we now go forward, and examine the social, cultural, political changes of the post-World War II period, be keenly aware of how all of those changes spark a backlash. This is not a story of forward movement towards a more equal and just America. Quite the contrary. Not only would that be inaccurate and not true, to the history of civil rights, it also wouldn't be accurate or true to the themes that I stress in this class. Contest, argument, debate, that's at the heart of American history in totality and certainly it is at the heart of our history here of civil rights. When advances are made, it's not the end of the story. Those advances often spark backlashes. It's a field of argument, it's a field of contest where these issues of citizenship, equality and freedom are at play. So do not think of civil rights as a linear vision of progress, a linear story of progress, because a lot of the progress that's made engenders a backlash that thwarts the progress. Sometimes the backlash wins. And we don't have to work too hard to see that today in the 21st century. What's the backlash to Brown? Well, massive resistance, particularly in the South with its large African-American population and the prospects of political and social equality for African-Americans is so potent. 1956, congressmen and senators from mostly Southern states, but not exclusively, authored and signed the Southern Manifesto where they pledged legal resistance to the enforcement of Brown. Now it's important to again know that the Brown decision came in May of 1954, but again, people who refuse to treat racial minorities equally don't just shrug their shoulders and say, all right, come on in, you're welcome to learn in our classrooms. They, provide, they follow a number of different procedures and means to prevent that from happening. So in 1956, we have not desegregated as a nation. There's massive resistance to it. School districts, particularly in the South, close. They refuse to open their doors. They declare themselves private, even though they are publicly funded because Brown didn't apply to private schools. It only applied to, to public education. So in 1956, when the Southern Manifesto is written and signed by congressmen and senators, they were part of this resistance that at that point had successfully blocked 
the enforcement of the Brown decision. Now, the language of the Southern Manifesto, quoted here in quotation marks, is resistance by all any lawful means. But that's because this document was written by lawmakers, and they had to stress this as an action within the law, an effort by lawful means to resist what they found revolting and anathema, the image of black school children learning in the same classroom as white school children. But the backlash to Brown and civil rights more broadly, as we will see in these lectures, is not limited to lawful means. Extra legal means, violence, intimidation, terrorism, will be also central to the backlash story, the backlash element of this history of civil rights enunciated here in these lectures. Though the senators and congressmen say, we're gonna resist by lawful means, this was an open nod in many ways to those who would employ extra legal and unlawful means, including violence and terrorism, to prevent America from becoming a more equal and just nation. As I mentioned, the resistance to desegregation took many different forms, including some school districts simply closing, refusing to educate any children if it meant educating African-American children, if it meant treating black and white children equally. This is the drained pool politics that the scholar Heather McGee refers to in the book she published recently, where she uses public pools as a metaphor. Public pools were also places uh, at the heart of these debates about race and civil rights. There were efforts to desegregate public pools in the same period. And when those decrees come from courts that say you have to let everyone use this public pool, what happens around the country? Those municipalities, those cities drain their pools so nobody can use them. And Heather McGee in her wonderful book, The Sum of Us All, uses that as a metaphor to explain in many ways, not just what occurs in this period, but what continues to occur in the 21st century, where when faced with this question of one, we could treat everyone equally, or we could refuse to treat everyone equally, many states, individuals, municipalities would prefer to cut off their nose to spite their face, would prefer to injure themselves and close off public institutions and public services rather than allow everyone to use them. So rather than let everyone swim in the pool, we drain it so no one can use it. And that happened time and time again around this country in this period. And in regards to Brown, it led to many public school districts saying, we're just going to close our doors. We refuse. Many teachers refused to teach black children. Many school districts said, if this means I have to educate black learners, if this means black school children will sit in the same classroom as white school children, if this means my taxpayer money is going to fund such a desegregated school, well, I'll have none of it. And so you have these drain pool politics. You have this phenomenon of white families saying, you know what? I'm going to refuse my own children an education just so black children can attend the public school. This is a period where all of a sudden symbols of the Confederacy begin to reappear all over the South. And this too is a way for us to see connections to contemporary America. If you have followed in the last few years, the debate about Confederate monuments, statues to Confederate officers, if you follow that carefully, you will learn that most of those monuments that still stand around this country some of them here in Southern Cal we in Calif in Southern California, Los Angeles, we have, believe it or not, monuments to Confederate officers and soldiers, California. So this isn't a Southern thing. This isn't merely a Southern. There are monuments in the North, in the South, in the West, all over this country to traitors, to people who took up arms against this nation to preserve and extend slavery. Many of those monuments 
were erected during times of civil rights activism, like in the 1920s, in the aftermath of the Great Migration, and the protest movements against events like race riots in Tulsa. Well, then in the 1920s, all of a sudden you get all these monuments to the Confederacy. They don't go back to the immediate end of the Civil War. They weren't erected to honor veterans who were still alive. They were erected in the 1920s or in the 1950s and 1960s as symbols of defiance against civil rights. Many of the monuments that stand today to the Confederacy stand not because they were honoring those who served in the dishonorable Confederacy, but because they were using the Confederacy, using the symbolism associated with that effort to make a statement in opposition to civil rights. And that's why so many of these monuments that are now being thankfully taken down, removed, were erected in the 1920s or here in the 1950s and 1960s when Georgia votes to incorporate the Confederate battle flag into its state flag, a symbol of defiance, a symbol of, again, resistance to the federal government. In the Civil War, states secede from the Union because they refuse to be governed by a northern majority opposed to the expansion of slavery. They refused to be governed by Lincoln. And so you get the Civil War. And now, flash forward 100 years later, those same states are refusing to accept a federal government that in the Brown decision is demanding equality under law through the desegregation of public schools. One signal event in the story of the backlash to Brown concerns Little Rock, Arkansas, where, as in so many parts of the South, there was absolute defiance to the Brown decision, absolute refusal. The school district in Little Rock, Arkansas, refuses to allow black school children to attend Little Rock Central High, one of the four high schools serving Little Rock. This is an open challenge to Brown. This is an open challenge to the federal government. And what happens is, President of the United States says, my job under the Constitution is to enforce the law. The Supreme Court has made its decision. The Supreme Court has a role in the Constitution in this process of issuing interpretations of the Constitution and such rulings. And so my job is to enforce the ruling. And so Dwight David Eisenhower, a general who was used to using the military to get his way, used to coercive power, called in the 101st Airborne, forcing Little Rock Central High to desegregate. That is very revealing. This is what it took. This is what it took in 1957, not that long ago. We are at a moment now in the class where we're not talking about history anymore. We're talking about contemporary America. Believe it or not, I know it's hard for you guys to believe you're so young and vigorous. But there are people alive today in America who were alive in 1957, all right? So we're not talking about history now. We're talking about people's lives, many of whom are still around today. This is what it took a little more than 60 years ago to make possible what, thankfully, today we take for granted. When you return to classrooms and you look around and you see people from a variety of different backgrounds sitting next to you, we take that for granted today. When you walk into that lecture hall, you don't need an escort from the 101st Airborne paratroopers to allow you to come into that lecture hall, sit down, and be bored to death by your professor's lecture. So today we take this for granted. But just 60 years ago, it took paratroopers. It took the 101st Airborne. It took the coercive, forceful, federal authority doing this at gunpoint to allow black school children to walk into a public high school that is to serve the public in Little Rock, Arkansas. There's a lot here, history fans. First, it demonstrates again what I stress to you in these lectures and in this course. The cause of civil rights only goes forward when the federal government makes it so. The people of Little Rock, Arkansas did not say, you know what, we should all be equal. Let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. America's about freedom, equality, and opportunity. We were 1957, fighting the Cold War was the height of the Cold War. And we were telling ourselves and the world, we're a beacon of freedom and equality. And so in that year, 1957, Americans recognized that 
and they treated everyone as equal. No, bullshit. That's not what's happening here. They resisted that. And it took the coercive, forceful power of the federal government to force states, individuals, a local school district to do what they're not inclined to do. So this is very demonstrative of the necessary role the federal government must play in the cause of civil rights. There's a great deal of Cold War context that's key here. This likely wouldn't have happened if we weren't in a Cold War, in a propaganda war with the Soviets, where they were more than able and willing to call America out on its hypocrisy. We were attempting to win over hearts and minds around the globe. And our own racial failings hindered that. So what we've learned recently about the Cold War is key here. Civil rights took place in that way. Eisenhower was not a great champion of civil rights. He did this because he was being challenged by a state and he wasn't willing to allow a state to openly defy his authority as president. So again, he acts in this way. Also, perhaps most importantly, this is revelatory as to what it took to simply desegregate a public high school gunpoint. America doesn't, in the 1950s, again, have a change of hearts and minds, even though we are trying to change hearts and minds around the globe. Many Americans refused to accept this idea of racial equality, and they fought. And the only way to advance the cause of racial equality in this limited way in regards to public education was through force. That's what it took. Now, we often learn that this is the end of the story. We desegregated Little Rock High School, and now America was a place of equality for all. We had stamped out that resistance. Well, that's not the end of the story. Little Rock 9, the nine African-American students who were escorted by paratroopers and allowed to enter the building and assume their place as members of a public to be educated at this public school were harassed, bullied, physically abused, verbally abused, called the N-word. They were often targeted by teachers and administration. They were punished when they dared to retaliate against this verbal and physical abuse. Some of them, because of it, dropped out because they could not go through this day after day. And then the next year, the citizens of Little Rock, Arkansas, voted in a referendum to, once again, close their schools rather than accept desegregation. This is known as the lost year of 1958, where Little Rock High School closed in accordance with that trend that we've seen again and talked about in the slide where you drain the pool, where you close the public school because you don't want to accept what was enforced. And so for an entire year, the white and black school children of Little Rock went without a public education because we'd rather close a public school than abide by this Brown decision that demands that we share. We share our nation, we share our education, we recognize everyone is equal. So the 101st Airborne arrived and it meant the Little Rock Nine could walk in the building, but the next year the buildings closed. And then when in 1959, the buildings reopen and public education returns, the African-American children who attended Central High and others continued to be harassed in that way. So it's a complicated story. It's not a finite end. It's not a linear progression towards equality. It's argument, contest, and the Brown decision and the backlash to it are both important in seeing that argument and contest about freedom, equality, and citizenship. The next major development in our story here of race and civil rights, the Montgomery bus boycott. As I have stressed so far, as landmark, significant, controversial as the Brown decision was, it was limited to public education only. That means the rest of Jim Crow, the rest of apartheid America, the rest of the body of laws, strictures, 
that denied equality and freedom to racial minorities was still out there in 1954-1955. And so civil rights activists would turn their sights to the many ways in which America remained separate and unequal, including public transportation. December of 1955, a local activist was the last of a series of activists to be arrested for willfully resisting segregation in public transportation. Rosa Parks was arrested. She was not the first to be arrested. There were a number of other activists previous to her who had also engaged in these acts of civil disobedience, but her arrest was sort of the last straw. Rosa Parks refused to accept a public transportation system that rather than serve the public, segregated the public. She refused to accept second class status, to be denied equality and freedom in a nation that again during the Cold War was working overtime to declare itself a beacon of freedom and opportunity. Rosa Parks arrests, galvanizes a movement within Montgomery, Alabama, centered around public institutions like the church. What did African Americans do for decades when they were denied access to public institutions? Well, they formed their own. They formed their own self-aid societies, mutual aid societies, their own brotherhoods, their own burial society. What do you do? when you cannot bury your loved ones at the local cemetery because even cemeteries were segregated in America in the Jim Crow era. Even in death, we refused to accept blacks and whites in the same public space. Well, if that's the case, you have to cobble money together, buy your own land to bury your dead. And so burial societies were other institutions that were formed by racial minorities as they were denied access to public space and other public institutions. What do you do when you can't call the police or the local fire department because you're an African American and they refuse to serve you? So mutual aid societies, a variety of civic institutions were formed by racial minorities. And the black church, particularly in Montgomery, Alabama and other parts of the South was a key part of that. Churches were more than just places to baptize your children, get married, celebrate the various milestones in your life. They were political forces for organizing. And so when Parks is arrested, that institutional apparatus activates and African Americans and some of their white sympathizers began a boycott of the public transportation system in Montgomery, refusing to drop a dime into a public transportation system that treats American citizens differently based on the color of their skin, a public transportation system that does not serve the public, but rather segregates the public. Now, we often learn that Rosa Parks was a quiet, meek woman who, oops, accidentally changed history. We learned that her feet hurt her that day, and that's why she refused to give up her seat. That's bullshit. It's deliberate and conscious bullshit, but it's bullshit. Rosa Parks knew exactly what she was doing. She was part of an organized effort. This was part of an effort by African Americans to protest, to use a variety of means to demand equality. Rosa Parks was an activist. She was a member of the local NAACP. So please never accept again that representation. You may yourself have heard of Rosa Parks as this quiet, mousy woman who accidentally changed American history. No, she fits within a pantheon, a story of American heroes who were willing to resist, be disobedient, be arrested in an effort to make America a better nation. Rosa Parks knew exactly what she was doing that day. Her arrest sparked outrage, activated that institutional support system, and it launched this boycott where African Americans for 381 days refused to support the system that reinscribed their second class status. They refused to drop a dime in, patronize, support a public transportation system that refused to treat them 
equally, that's segregated. Public transportation. So again, we're back to this concept of the public. Who's one of us? It's another key moment in this argument without end regarding that question of citizenship. Who is one of us? Who fits under that banner of we the people? Through the cold of an Alabama winter, through the heat of an Alabama summer, African Americans and some of their white sympathizers walked to work, walked to school, walked to church. And that, for us Southern California types, is really good evidence of sacrifice, of this willingness to make a sacrifice in the cause of a better America, because we Southern Californians, we don't walk anywhere. Hell no, right? You know, your friend lives up the street, you drive to his house, right? We don't carpool, we don't share our cars, we'd rather sit in traffic for hours than actually share our car with another human being. Well, in the Montgomery bus boycott, people did walk. When they walked to school, when they walked to church, when they walked to work, they were called the N-word. They were beaten. They were spat upon. They were spat upon and beaten because they were protesting against inequality. They did carpool. They shared their cars with others. Whatever it took to make sure your friend, your coworker, your neighbor did not have to use the bus system. And so an informal network of taxis developed where people shared rides, where people offered a seat in their car in this remarkable show of unity. This is the original Uber, you know. This is the original ride sharing, but this doesn't involve getting your drunk ass home. This involves protesting in the cause of equality and freedom for all. And the Montgomery bus boycott only ends when they win. In November of 1956, U.S. Supreme Court, that Warren Court, yeah, there we go. Once again, it's about big government. It's about the federal government. It's about the Supreme Court. Where does this change come from, right? It's very key. In November of 1956, that Warren Court upheld a lower court ruling that declared segregation in public transportation unconstitutional. Another brick in the edifice of Jim Crow crumbled. Change is slow. Change comes with backlash. But we are now seeing steady change in the 1950s at the behest and demands through the sacrifice of African Americans. We are seeing change here in law. Change coming in law regarding equality, freedom, and citizenship. Now, change in law is limited. Again, we're not changing hearts and minds. We're not changing attitudes. The change does come from the federal government, and that often sparks a backlash. But it's also change that, again, is advancing thanks to a group of Americans who refuse to accept second-class status. The Montgomery bus boycott, like Brown, very much loaded and freighted, very revelatory, a good piece of historical evidence here in regards to what civil rights is all about. It's great complexity, the progress, the regress, where change comes from, and most importantly, perhaps, who is responsible for that change. It's not, again, a matter of whites changing their attitudes. It's about Rosa Parks. It's about the black church. It's about this institutional support system. It's about those African Americans who continued to walk, even though they were spat upon, hit with batteries and baseball bats. They're the agents of change here. And those efforts continued. In the late 50s and early 60s, America is awash in a variety of forms of protests by African Americans seeking greater equality and opportunity. That too is important to stress here. What African Americans and other racial minorities were demanding at this time wasn't anything extra. They were simply demanding what all Americans should be guaranteed, equality, freedom, opportunity, in that context of a Cold War where America was actively cultivating that image for itself. What African Americans and other activists were demanding was that America live up to that. 
So they weren't asking for anything beyond what should already be the rights of all Americans. And so they staged sit-ins and protests. They employed boycotts, which we talked about earlier. The boycott in Montgomery was so successful that that strategy would be employed by racial minorities in the civil rights era again and again, using your leverage, using your leverage as consumers, refusing to buy where they don't employ people who look like you. That was a big part of the civil rights effort. Don't buy where you can't work. That was a key slogan in the civil rights era. If you go to a store and there are no black people working there, if you're an African-American or you support the civil rights effort, don't spend your money there. One of the things that hopefully you've seen through the course of this class is how in the modern era, Consumerism is really central to American life, American history. In many ways, you can think of this course as one in which consumerism is constantly in the background, whether it's the New Deal or now civil rights. Consumerism is a big part of modern American history. And with a consumer-centered economy and society comes the possibility as consumers to use your leverage for political causes. And that's why today, Consumerism is so fraught with politics, but that's often the case throughout the history of this intersection between consumer capitalism and civil rights. And boycotts are a big part of that. One effort in this era, the Freedom Riders. These were often white, college-educated Northerners who came to the South as part of their own activism. Freedom Riders were young people who went to the South to encourage African Americans to register to vote. Now, ostensibly under law, all Americans of age had the right to vote in say 1961, when the Freedom Riders were really at the height of their efforts. The 50th Amendment ratified in 1870 says you cannot deny someone the right to vote based on race. The 19th Amendment, ratified in 1920, says you cannot deny someone the right to vote based on sex. So again, ostensibly, both black and male, uh, both <laughs> black men and black women in 1961 had the right to vote. But of course, in reality, they were actively denied the right to vote through a variety of means, some of which we've talked about, literacy tests, poll taxes, understanding clauses, and of course, violence, terrorism, and intimidation. In parts of the South, simply filling out a voter registration card saying, I intend maybe to vote, not actually showing up to vote, simply filling out a voter registration card was enough to get the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan to burn a cross on your front lawn. So terrorism, violence, intimidation effectively disenfranchised millions of Americans at a time again in which we like to stylize ourselves in the Cold War as the great beacon of democracy around the globe. Freedom Riders were urging African Americans to register to vote and to participate in local politics. They were working to urge African Americans to exercise again what ostensibly was their right, but had been actively denied to them. Look at their name. They did not choose as their name the Voting Brigade or the Voter Registration Drive. What do they choose as their name? Freedom Riders. That's what they refer to themselves as. What's at stake here? It's more than just voting. It's freedom itself. It's what voting symbolizes. It's what voting often proffers freedom, political freedom. And so you had the Freedom Riders sweeping through parts of the South, attempting to make America a more free nation, a more democratic nation, encouraging African Americans to register to vote and exercise their political liberty and political voice. And wherever they went, they were met by a violent backlash. When Freedom Riders arrived in Birmingham, Alabama, the local head of the police, Bull Connor, partnered with local chapters of the Klan. And so when Freedom Riders got off the bus expecting to be protected by the cops, the cops were there to beat them. And the cops tipped off the local chapter of the Klan to be there at that certain moment. 
in Birmingham, these civil rights activists who were acting in the name of freedom and attempting to make America a more free nation were beaten by baseball bats, bicycle chains. One of the freedom riders in Birmingham was beaten so severely he needed 50 stitches in his head. When they took him to a local hospital, the local hospital refused to serve him because the hospital was segregated. We're not going to stitch up the head of this African-American. And so he had to go to another hospital. Backlash. Backlash takes the form of draining swimming pools and barring the doors of high schools, but it also takes place in the form of absolute violence and terrorism by Americans who again refuse to accept a more equal America. In September of 1962, an African American, James Meredith, through a series of legal challenges, again advanced by civil rights activists and that institutional support system, successfully lobbied to matriculate at the University of Mississippi. His name was James Meredith. James Meredith would go on to be the very first African American to matriculate at Old Miss, the University of Mississippi, which previously segregated based on race refused blacks admittance to that university, a public university. During the Civil War, Old Miss served as a training ground, literal training ground for Confederate soldiers. On the greens, on the fields there at Old Miss, young men were trained to fight in an effort to preserve and extend slavery. Flash forward a hundred years later, the descendants of slaves, James Meredith, would step foot on that campus and enter as part of the incoming freshman class. There's a statue of James Meredith on the campus of Old Miss today. Since his efforts, many more African Americans have attended that university. We have the university system we now take for granted where you sit alongside people from a variety of backgrounds. But to make that possible, we needed the brave efforts of people like James Meredith and the Freedom Riders, the people captured here in this photograph, who again are refusing to accept second class status during this period of intense protests. 1963 would prove to be a fateful and important year in the history of the modern civil rights movements. The protests, the sit-ins, the boycotts, the efforts of the Freedom Riders were really at a zenith, at a peak in the spring of 1963 with demonstrations all throughout the South and various forms of resistance, including organized violence, terrorism from white supremacist groups like the Klan. In one week in the spring of 1963 in June, 15,000 people were arrested in almost 200 cities as they engaged in this great collision over civil rights, citizenship, and freedom. Many in this movement branched out from simply the right to sit where one pleased or the right to enter a school. They branched out their movement to be this great racial reckoning in the cause of true equality for all, where institutions that had been deliberately barred, closed to people would now be opened where African-Americans and other racial minorities could pursue home ownership, pursue higher education, work in professions that again had been closed to them, work in labor unions that in 1963, again, not that long ago, still refused to have racial minorities as members. This was now about a vision of America as open to all where people regardless of their skin color could pursue an education, a career, the American dream without restrictions and limits. In May of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr., who had emerged by now as a leading figure in the civil rights efforts, the head, the pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Georgia, journeyed to Birmingham, hoping to again stage a protest a non-violent protest against the various forms of segregation, racism, discrimination that predominated in the city of Birmingham, where just two years prior, 
people had been beaten for simply pursuing the right to vote. And another collision where those who marched in this cause of civil rights were beaten by the local police, by white supremacists, Klansmen, right there in broad daylight. Some of those who were beaten, attacked, were children who simply, again, wanted to be equal members of this nation. The local police force using its power. Again, this isn't simply a story of racists. This is about segregation and force through law, and in this case, law enforcement. Local police turned dogs on the protesters. Fire hoses on the protesters beat them with billy clubs. And all this was captured on television. And now we introduce another factor that we have hitherto neglected in regards to civil rights. Another important fact that you must understand in order to truly comprehend this period. There had been efforts in the early 20th century in the cause of civil rights, protests, boycotts, but they were less successful. Why is it this moment in the 50s and 60s when the limited progress we see does go forward? Well, some of it, again, has to do with the Cold War and that context. Civil rights wouldn't have been as successful without the Cold War as context. Some of this stems from changes in federal institutions like Earl Warren assuming this role as Supreme Court Justice. Of course, the greatest factor is the determination, the dogged determination of people like A. Philip Randolph and Rosa Parks and others we will soon meet who just demanded this and would not relent. But there's another factor, one that is unique to this period, that develops in this period that must also be introduced here in order for you to understand the success, the relative success of the post-World War II civil rights era. Television. In the 1950s and 1960s, this wasn't taking place in Birmingham. It was taking place in your living room. You saw on your TV 200-pound cops beating a 14-year-old girl with a baseball bat. Why? Because that 14-year-old girl wanted to attend the local high school or to walk in the library and pull a book off the shelf. Again, they weren't asking for anything beyond what should already be the rights of all people. And for that, they are hit in the head repeatedly with a tire chain, a baseball bat. And it's right there confronting you on the television. Television plays a key role in civil rights because you could not deny this. You could not ignore it. It was in your living room. And you had to pick sides. Whose side are you on? Are you on the side of that 200-pound cop who's beating a little girl with a baseball bat? Or are you on the side of that little girl and millions like her who just want to be equal members of this nation? So another factor that helps explain changes in those who will change their hearts and minds, television, where this moral calculus now descended into your living room, now confronted you. Birmingham, the battle here, the great clashes throughout the nation, they were right there in your face, demanding that you pick sides, and many, as a result, did come to side with the righteous campaigns and protests of these civil rights activists. Nevertheless, the bloodshed continued. Medgar Evers was a lawyer who as part of his activism, was instrumental to the efforts to desegregate Ole Miss and allow James Meredith to step forward onto that campus. Because of that and a variety of other efforts, Medgar Evers was assassinated by the Klan as he exited his car and walked up his front driveway to walk into his home and be greeted by his family. He was shot in the back. When they rushed him to the hospital, the local hospital refused to serve him because he was black. He was bleeding to death and they refused to save him. He had to go to another hospital and he soon perished. Later in 63, this fateful year, a church in Birmingham is firebombed by the Klan and four girls 
are killed. I mentioned this earlier. It's not something we often acknowledge. Not only does the cause of civil rights only go forward when the federal government plays this necessary role in securing the rights of vulnerable minorities, another thing that has to happen, people have to die. It took a civil war and the death of almost 700,000 people to end slavery. And now, in what's sometimes referred to as the Second Emancipation or the Second Reconstruction, once again, people are killed. People have to lose their lives. Blood is shed. Medgar Evers, those four teenage girls in a church in Birmingham. Dr. King killed by a white supremacist in Memphis in 68. People lost their lives. People were killed. People shed blood to make America a more free and just nation. These events, this violence, in one way demonstrates a backlash. It demonstrates the efforts by white supremacists to refuse to accept this change and their willingness to use violence and terrorism to that end. It demonstrates, again, contest, argument. It helps you understand an America where blood continues to be shed and people continue to lose their lives when they dare demand equality and freedom for all. But it also demonstrates how this change often only comes through such sacrifices and bloodshed. 1963 would see the Battle of Birmingham, the martyrdom and death of Medgar Evers, the death of those four girls in that black church in Birmingham, a wave of protests. And it would also see an effort by a quarter of a million Americans to secure legal equality for all. The March on Washington took place in the summer of 1963 where a quarter of a million Americans would descend on the nation's capital, what was seen as the capital of democracy around the world and demand some democracy here at home. The March on Washington was led by the man you see here in this photograph, the very bottom there, the forefront, A. Philip Randolph, who we met in our previous lecture on World War II on the home front as the man who during World War II spearheaded an effort of equality, demanding equal pay for equal work, threatening then to have such a march where every black worker would walk off the job and demand what should again already be their right, equality and opportunity for all. That effort saw then President Franklin Roosevelt respond with Executive Order 8802 that mandated equal pay for equal work. Well, in the summer of 1963, A. Philip Randolph would have his march, where now a quarter of a million Americans would descend on the nation's capital, then attempting to build support for a civil rights bill that at the time in 1963 was being stymied and thwarted in Congress. 1963, there was an effort to pass a civil rights bill that, if passed, would end public segregation, public discrimination under law in American life, would end the last vestiges of Jim Crow. We've seen Jim Crow dismantled slowly here in this lecture through the dogged, deliberate efforts with the Montgomery bus boycott previous to that, Brown v. Board of Education. But in 1963, when the March on Washington takes place, it was still perfectly legal to refuse to serve racial minorities, refuse to hire racial minorities. It's perfectly legal for labor unions to say we won't have blacks or Latinos or Asian Americans as members. There were so many elements of Jim Crow under law, de jure, segregation, discrimination in place. But there's an effort to pass a bill that would end that. And the March on Washington in the summer of 1963 was designed to build support, put pressure on Congress to pass the bill. And so you had this March on Washington, a call for passage of that civil rights bill. You had this March on Washington, this major effort, whose slogan was jobs and freedom. And this is often lost, again, in our historical memory. 
We tend to focus on the freedom side of that slogan, jobs and freedom, and ignore what was as important to A. Philip Randolph and the organizers of this protest, the jobs side of that slogan, jobs and freedom. This too helps us connect many themes and trends in this class. Go back to our first lecture on reconstruction. What did freedom mean to the millions of emancipated slaves? 40 acres and a mule. It meant economic opportunity. And the history of civil rights through American history has always been about economic opportunity, whether it was 40 acres and a mule, whether it was the great migration, the efforts of African Americans in the World War I era to seek better jobs in Northern cities. So the March on Washington focused on passing a civil rights bill and an effort to end segregation, but it was just as much about jobs, housing, education, the things that really make you free. Throughout the history of civil rights in America, African Americans and other racial minorities had a con concept of freedom that was deeply tied to jobs, education, housing, the things that really make you free and able to be in charge of your destiny, self-determination. Look at the photograph here. You'll see in the signs calls to end segregation in public schools and Jim Crow, but look how often you see housing, jobs. That was just as important here. Calls for an increase in the minimum wage as part of a freedom for all, a freedom that comes from greater economic opportunity chance to buy a home, chance to work in certain professions that again were foreclosed to racial minorities, a chance to join a labor union, which was for many Americans a pathway to home ownership in the middle class. So though we tend to focus on the I have a dream speech, the soaring rhetoric of Dr. King, the vision of America as one where we could move beyond race and be a nation of equality for all, as a political effort, a political movement, this was about political change, passing a civil rights bill, and it was about jobs. It was about a vision of freedom and opportunity that comes from economic change, economic opportunity. That was central to a march on Washington in the summer of 1963. That was central to the vision of freedom. If you read the I Have a Dream speech, not just what's quoted around Martin Luther King Jr. Day, or that may appear in a documentary, it's about substantive legal changes for economic and educational opportunity. King was an advocate of what today we would call affirmative action, what we would today call an interventionist role in the government, in, by the government and the economy to create new institutions that open pathways to education, home ownership, so we may today fixate on the I have a dream speech and the soaring rhetoric, but we do so at our peril because we lose this stubborn and key historical fact. This was about passing a law that would see the federal government intervene in society, in the economy, that would end Jim Crow. It was about federal legislation. It was about big government. It was about that civil rights bill. And it was about jobs, housing, education, what A. Philip Randolph, the 250,000 people who marched that day, really recognized as the means of freedom, economic opportunity. Look at this picture you see in the signs, jobs, housing, education. And you also see a lot of white faces. Another key aspect of the March on Washington is that in many ways, this is the zenith of a black-white consensus and connection in the cause of passing a civil rights bill and addressing segregation discrimination in an America that liked to see itself as a defender of freedom and liberty. As we'll see in our next lecture, in the late 60s, after that civil rights bill is, fast, is passed, after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is passed, when the focus of civil rights turns to economic opportunity, housing, education, when Dr. King and others become advocates for various forms of affirmative action, more government spending, more interventionist roles, 
when the critique expands to police brutality and the use of institutional violence against black bodies, that black-white cooperation breaks down. And the civil rights movement changes and America changes. As we will talk about in lectures to come, in 1964, Lyndon Johnson, who by that time had signed the Civil Rights Act into law, will be elected president in a landslide, a liberal Democrat now responsible for the Civil Rights Act. He would go on to sign into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Hart Seller Act, immigration reform in 1965 that would open our borders to people from Africa, Asia, Latin America. But just four years later, in 1968, a conservative Republican who runs on the message of law and order, Richard Nixon, is elected president. And he's reelected in 1972, 49 states to one. America will take a very conservative turn in the late 60s when civil rights branches out to issues of police reform, economic opportunity. And many whites who supported the cause of civil rights in the early 60s will vote for Nixon and cleave in a conservative direction. It's a complicated story. It's not a linear story of progress, advancement, and equality for all. It's a field of contest, one that we will continue in our next lecture as we continue our look here at race and civil rights in the post-World War II era.